I'd like to introduce Don Hill, and he was the past president of OSAA back in 1988. And Don is here tonight to provide us with a reflection on OSAA's highlights over the 75 years of its existence. Don has devoted 25 acres to a wide range of vegetables sold through a roadside market, a farmer's market, and you pick strawberries and raspberries for almost 40 years. He has a 45 beef cow enterprise selling yearlings, a small sheep flock, and 200 acres of field crop, mostly forages to support the cattle and sheep enterprises. Don spent two years of, his early, of the early 90s as an instructor for the Ontario Pesticide Education Program. And prior to that, in the early 60s until mid-70s, he was a soil and crop specialist field crops with the OMF at the time. Don has been involved in many committee memberships, including the Minister's Advisory Committee on Environmental Responsibilities, the Ontario Farm Environmental Coalition Working Group, Chair of the Advisory Committee to the Canada-Ontario Environmental Sustainability Accord Committee, and member of the Gray County Land Stewardship Committee. Furthermore, Don is a past president of Huronia branch of the Ontario Institute of Ag Agrologists, the Gray County Federation of Agriculture, Gray County's Cattlemen's Association, the OSCIA, a board member of the Ontario Stockyards, the Associate Director of the Chatsworth and Sydenham Agricultural Societies, 4-H Club Leader and Directors of the Twin County Feeder Finance Co-op, Owen Sound Farmers Market, Vendors Association, and Gray County's Pork Producers Association. So let's give a welcome to Don as he comes up and gives us uh, some reminiscences of the 75 years of OSCIA. Welcome, Don. Thank you, Al. I brought a few notes with me, and I've since been informed that uh, the rest of the program took a little longer than was expected, so I'm expected to take a little less time than was expected. <laughs> With all those expectations, we're all in trouble. <laughs> Alan Mole found out after he became a director of this organization and then a member of the executive that there are a lot of responsibilities that go with that job. And he soon found out that being from Northern Ontario was a little bit of a handicap because there's an awful lot of traveling to do. And to help make it a little easier, and because his wife wanted to see him awake sometime, <laughs> he hired a driver to get him from one meeting to the next while he's making his presentations. So they're driving one night to Sault Ste. Marie. It's going to be an urban audience. The driver starts arguing with Alan and saying, you know, nobody there is going to know who you are. So, I've heard your speech so often, let me do it. Alan says, no way, I could really be in trouble with OSCIA if you goof up. He says, I won't goof up. He says, I know what you say. He says, nobody there is going to know you from me. So you let me be the speaker and you sit at the back of the room. Alan says, okay. They get there and he's relaxing at the back of the room. The young lad is up at the front. He's doing really well. He's, he's sailing right along and he's getting a little more wind in his sails all the time. And finally, he gets to the end of the presentation, and he said, and are there any questions? Alan just starts to shrivel. <laughs> First question is just a real zinger. Alan says, what's he going to do now? And he stood there for a minute, and he thought. He said, you know, I don't want to tell you, sir, that this is a very, very simple question, but I'm sure my chauffeur at the back of the room can answer it for you. <laughs> I'm not sure why I'm up here, other than it may be that the organization and I happen to be exactly the same age. <laughs> now, I don't remember much about the very early history, but my first association with this organization was a trip to the Gray County Seed Fair. And this was in the mid-40s, would have been after the war was well underway. And uh, my father had decided that he needed some better seed or some new seed or something. Anyway, 
he cleaned up a whole bunch of it, loaded it in a trailer, hooked it on behind the old Ford car they were driving at the time, and we went to the seed fair. And at that fair, he, I guess, sold what he had and bought somebody else's and loaded it up. But they were having a market hog carcass competition at a seed fair and a community center, hanging on some wooden racks, and there were a whole raft of sides of hogs hanging there because they were trying to convince Ontario farmers that we had to grow a leaner bacon type hog to supply the people in England that were dying because they couldn't get decent bacon. And I'm not sure, but I suspect there's a whole bunch of people in this room like me with a bit of gray hair that given all the rules and regulations we have about food safety and wearing bike helmets, we shouldn't be here today. <laughs> there's probably a whole lot of other reasons why we shouldn't be here today too, but we'll leave those on undone. The people that really make this organization work are the secretaries that we've had over the years. And for a long time those secretaries were staff of the Ministry of Agriculture at the time or the Department of Agriculture or the Department of Agriculture and Food or whatever. They kept changing the name all the time. And one of them, I think it was John Curtis, finally caught on to the fact that this was a very powerful position that he sat in as a member of the staff in Toronto and as secretary manager of the OSCIA. Because what John could do or what any secretary could do is very easily have a chat with the executive sometime and some of the other important folks in this organization. And he could suggest to them some of the, his pet projects that really should come up as resolutions at the annual meeting. See where this is going yet? <laughs> and I'm sure that they did a lot of the time because these resolutions came back and of course they got passed at the annual meeting because most of them did, an odd one failed. They'd get passed, so then the executive would give them back to the secretary manager and say, here, you look after these. So he could take those resolutions and wander into the minister's office and say, this is the resolutions that were passed by the Soil and Crop Improvement Association with this whole raft of people at their annual meeting. I think we really should do something about it. So what do you think the minister does with those sorts of things when some of his staff bring him something like that? There's somebody sitting right down here in the front that knows. <laughs> they probably say, go write an answer. <laughs> so it was a very powerful position to be sitting in because you could go get the minister's approval and if he didn't read it really carefully and didn't pay too much attention to it and said go write it, you could go back there and you could get your idea that you started off feeding into the organization passed and underway and away to the races. Somewhere along the line there, I guess somebody figured that out and we had to hire our own secretary manager and the first one of those people that we had was Doug Wagner. And I don't know how many of you have ever been to an early meeting of this organization when it was held in the King Eddie in Toronto, but is there anybody in the audience that has? There's one hand, any more? I remember one meeting that we had there. And uh, it used to be that uh, it was just like tonight, except the head table was up on the dais. It was a big long thing that ran all the way along. Piper brought everybody in, we all stood there and clapped our heads off. Everybody walked down along and for some reason or other they always ended up in the right seat. Everything was just fine. And I think the secretary manager might have been Byron Beeler because he came from the fruit and vegetable branch. And they put fruit and vegetable and field crops together and a lot of little rivalries going on but that's alright. But he's walking along as the secretary manager at the head of the parade right behind the Piper because the president and his wife and so on there about halfway back the line because they have to be in the middle of the head table when they get there. He walks up onto the end of the stage. We have to go back a little bit because the hotel never ever seemed to get everything right. And our secretary managers had the ability to chew out the hotel staff like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> so he's walking up the steps and all of a sudden as he walks along that head table, he's turning every wine bottle on the table and there weren't supposed to be wine bottles there, but he's turning every one of them around and he walks right off the other end of the table and right through the swinging doors. There's a whole roof of guys come back and they walk right down there picking off every wine bottle and the one right behind him setting an Ontario one on the table instead. <laughs> it's 
so what the hotel had done to try and make up for what they thought was a real faux pas, they'd gone and brought in some really good imported wine, put it on the head table. <laughs> Byron wasn't having any because it had to be Ontario. <laughs> so we've had a very, very influential, hardworking, dedicated staff that work for this organization and make it look really good. You've heard a whole lot about me from that introduction and I want to say a very special thank you Alan for the introduction and for the invitation to be here. It's an honor and a pleasure. Before I get into history I want to ask you if there's a few things that you can remember because I want to find out how many other historians there are in the group and how free I can be with facts and fancy. <laughs> How many of you remember a guy by the name of Gordon Sinclair? Oh, a whole bunch of hands. What was his first question? How much money do you make? He also said that there were four things that were real newsmakers. One is love. One is money. One is conquest. And one is a disaster. So the love part of this, I understand that if people talk too long and carry on too long and they start to lose the audience, what's really going on is that all those people out there, they're not falling asleep, their eyes are closed and they're having sexual fantasies. <laughs> Money, that really makes a lot of good press. I guess in our case, as the recent crop prices and the money that we spend on renting land and, and buying resources. And then we, we come to uh, conquests or victories. The victory is going to be if you can still be awake when I quit talking. <laughs> and the disaster is going to be when I get knee deep into history and forget what I'm talking about, <laughs> which may happen. We have a motto for this organization that was accepted a long, long time ago, and I guess it's still in use, but uh, there's a whole history book, and I read a lot of it just so I could act intelligent, but it's called Two Blades of Grass Where One Grew Before. And uh, I heard a very interesting discussion when I used to be a staffer with the ministry and I had to attend every one of these annual meetings. And we were sitting, a group of us, some of us from the staff, some from of the presidents and directors, and they were discussing this business of two blades of grass, and one of them had decided that if we did that, what he could see down the road was a day when there would be half as many farmers in Ontario as there were then. And if he were around today, he'd be more than right. A few years later, in the early 50s, they were discussing the same thing again, they had a speaker from across the border talking to us and he was suggesting to them that after the war and moving into the 50s that we really should be talking about and focusing on producing two blades of grass for the cost of producing one. In other words, he could see some financial problems coming for the organization. We used to have a county secretary that worked in Norfolk County and uh, I don't know how many people here know him. His name was Roy Richards, and Roy was a poet as well as an agricultural representative. And I want to read you one of his poems that uh, is entitled The Soil. Your livestock may be handsome, brought from homes across the sea. Your tools of toil may glisten with their newness running free. You may own the finest buildings, but you first must understand that the art of honest farming is the tilling of the land. In your urgency to prosper, though you labor long and willing, from the dawn's first echoes break to the evening air so chilling, you'll not gain from your endeavor, profit nothing from your toil, until you are the master of God's gift to you, the soil. How many of you uh, remember agricultural offices <laughs> in every county. whole bunch of hands. Yeah. Let's see, what else can we come up with here? 
How about alfalfa weevil and cereal leaf beetle? Back in the early 70s, they were two things that were going to wipe crop production in Ontario right off the map unless we found some way of controlling them. They sort of turned out to be no-shows because we started cutting alfalfa earlier and the alfalfa weevil didn't really become a pest. What happened to the cereal leaf beetle, I really have no, no idea. Barberry eradication. The other name for that program was wipe out maple trees because uh, brush kill wasn't working very well and it had been found out to be a little bit dangerous and somebody came up with a bright idea that you could use a product called Tordon. And then somebody else found out that if you were killing barberry and you happened to walk around with the lid off a bottle of Tordon and walked underneath a maple tree, it promptly lay down and died. So there was no more Tordon used to control alfalfa weevil, or sorry, to control barberry. We're getting a little further back in history. How many people remember seed drill surveys? That was a little scheme that the Soil and Crop Improvement Association had to blackmail people into buying better seed. And they sent a whole bunch of directors and anybody else they could find out into the country to walk into everybody's field when they were planting and grab a big handful of seed out of the box, put their name on it and send it off to the Canada Department of Agriculture and they went through it and told them exactly what the germination was, how many wheat seeds they had in it and all this kind of stuff and they were going to blackmail everybody into buying pedigreed seed and making sure it was cleaned. And then there was a seed cleaning train. <laughs> this was supposed to be a real gift to Northern Ontario. So they had a seed cleaning train that had all the equipment on it and a couple of guys to run it and the CN and CP hauled it from place to place whenever they happened to be going that way anyway and they'd set up on a siding and you could take your grain in and get it cleaned in the seed cleaning train. And uh, they did something like 33 stops in one year in what they called Old Ontario at that time and 18 stops in the north. Whether they made it all the way to Thunder Bay or not, Alan, I don't know. <laughs> I've been uh, married for a while, not as long as I've uh, been involved with OSCIA. But I did learn a lot of things, and that is that if you want people to remember something, telling them doesn't work because they can forget that really easily. If you tack on... <laughs> Sorry, sir. If you tack on some visual things, it lasts about twice as long as if you just heard it. So I'm going to try tacking on some visual things and I assume that there's some button here that you push and somebody said don't touch the red one. <laughs> Have we got a picture? No? One at three o'clock. I should have asked this question. Three o'clock. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this might be about as uh, well known as I ever get. And I think you know that I come from Gray County, but uh, you know, that's someplace in Southern Ontario. And that is a map of Southern Ontario. And I think that's the way most people look at it. But uh, we have this crazy idea of looking at it this way. Anybody see an elephant? <laughs> His trunk is down in Canton, Essex. Look where you live. <laughs> I'm going to ask you next year if you remember where we live. <laughs> and that's the crew, but we have one more now. His name is Case. And since he didn't want him to get mixed up with Case Tractors, so he's K-A-S-E. It should have been K-E-E-S, but we don't know how to pronounce Dutch names, so he's, go he's going to be Case. We've always been an organization that's trying to get information across, trying to solve problems. This poor guy has a problem. He's going to try the first thing, which is talking, and we decided talking doesn't really work all that well. So we like to do a demonstration. <laughs> and then we always report to the annual meeting about how successful the demonstration was. And I've been totally amazed. I 
I've been totally amazed over the years listening to all the project reports that I've listened to from this organization, and in almost all cases, nothing is significant. <laughs> and then you guys go sneaking off home, and first thing you know, you've got a 75 bushel crop of corn up to 100, and then 100 up to 150. And now we've got people talking about 200 bushels of corn per acre. So somewhere along the line, something's working. I'm not sure what it is, but something's working because we're, we're getting there. Back when this organization was formed, there wasn't a lot of things that uh, you could do to improve agriculture other than making sure that you had the most recent seed and the cleanest seed, the best stuff you could buy. Anybody want to put a name on these two gentlemen? Jim Barry. Jim Barry. Jim Barry. And the other one? Bill Taylor. Bill Taylor, the best dressed elevator inspector and weed inspector in the province that the province ever had. <laughs> Bill always told us, I don't know whether it's right or not, he said he always carried a pair of coveralls in the trunk of the car when he was out doing his checkups on elevators. He said he only had to get them out once. So he'd been in this establishment and decided there was something fishy going on and the guy wasn't coming through. So Bill went out, took off the suit jacket, got the coveralls out of the trunk, so I didn't even have to put them on. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we do that sometimes too. We have some pretty wonderful exhibits and shows and things, and, uh, and we do get the message across. Back then, there wasn't much you could do with your soil other than pay really good attention to organic matter and tilth and drainage, because there weren't a whole lot of things that you could add for fertilizer. And most farmers took exceptionally good care of manure, and they also did a pretty reasonable job of trying to make sure that they didn't destroy the organic matter and that they did plant an awful lot of legumes because then there wasn't any artificial nitrogen or nitrogen as we know it today. That didn't come until the end, about the end of the Second World War. So most farmers knew that they really had to uh, look after and pay attention to their soil. The other thing that was going on back when this organization was formed was that there was a big debate on about open pollinated and hybrid corn. And hybrid corn was just coming into Ontario and uh, there was a real push on to make sure that uh, that, that succeeded and then we had the beginnings of the uh, Seed Corn Growers Marketing Board. And Kent County actually put together a little book that's worth reading, it's called Pulling Tassels. So if you ever get your hands on it, have a look at it. The other thing they had was soil erosion, and we were all going to do something about soil erosion. Because you lost too much when you lost your soil. Fertilizer didn't come along until the end of the war years, and if you could read the label on that bag, when I tried to get a magnifying glass on it, it said 02020, because we didn't have any nitrogen source. And it was a while after that, maybe it's even 01010. Very low analysis fertilizer. People were really worried about it. They didn't have drills with fertilizer boxes on them, most of them. This is what they called a plow sole applicator, and it's on a two furrow plow, and it's dribbling a little bit of fertilizer, and you see the white stuff in the bottom of the furrow. And that was to make sure that it didn't damage the seed or cause any problems. When the Cockshut 11 drill came along, it was an answer to everybody's prayers because it had separate boxes. You didn't have to mix the fertilizer with the grain anymore. You knew what, how much you were putting on. And it even had a grass seed box or a forage seed box right down near the ground at the back so that you could pretty accurately place the, the seed in rows. Grassland days were fantastic attractions back then and this was coming into the war years and they were important because the extension branch and the government were trying to convince them that they really needed to plant a lot more legumes in those pastures and we needed the pastures and we needed the beef cattle and we needed the manure to grow crops and we needed the meat for the for the war effort so being a very uh, trying to be very equal in my advertising that says ck and x on the back of the tailgate i had to do one for cfos which is gray county and again, these guys were all out in the pasture field having a big chat about how to produce better pasture crops. The guy standing at the end is a gentleman by the name of Tommy Cooper. And back in those days, the ag office was open till 12 noon on Saturdays. Tommy had a radio broadcast 30, 38, 40 miles north in Owen Sound 
at one o'clock and he made those broadcasts at one o'clock and right after that they delayed the lunch for the Kiwanis Club because he was a Kiwanis Club member and right after his radio state talk was over at the radio station he beat all over to the Kiwanis Club and have his lunch and he talked those guys into planting a whole bunch of pine trees up at a little place called Hepworth where the soil was really sandy and blowing away and that became the Kiwanis Christmas tree effort and it's still going on today. Now how many people remember Gestetner? Do you know what that is? Yeah, a whole bunch of hands. This guy could come into the ag office, say hi to the girls, put his stencil on the old Gestetner machine and he'd stand there just the winding her, just as hard as she'd go with his foot going. And he'd run off the sale bills for the co-op cattle sale in Wyarton. And then when he got all done, he'd, he'd, he'd conscript anybody that was in the office to help him collate and staple the damn things. So into the boardroom you go, he lay all these piles out, four or five or six of them around the table, and then we'd run around the table after him, grabbing one sheet off each pile and stapling it, and then run around and do it again. And he never used the counter on that Gestetner, and I tell you, there were never more than one or two or three sheets left in any pile. How he could do it, talk to the girls, count at the same time, but he couldn't. Okay, what else do we need to talk about here for a minute? That's it. We'll just keep right on going. <laughs> this was an important part of our annual meetings in Toronto. And these were exhibits that were made by various people. This one was by the Ontario Agriculture College. And again, it was near the first of uh, the Second World War and they were pushing grass silage, legume silage, trying to get people to produce more high quality feed, more milk in the, in the winter time. This group of people, and I need some help here. Who is the gentleman on your right? The very interested looking guy with his hands folded. Anybody know? No, this, this is, I should tell you what this is. This is a picture taken out of the exhibition grounds after the OSCIA had decided, the Ontario Crop Improvement Association had decided to go in with the farm machinery people to hold the annual meeting. Now, the gentleman on this end, sorry. The gentleman with the glasses and his hands behind his back, his last name is Sykes, I don't remember his first name. He's the guy that ran the show for Orfita. Anybody tell me what Orfita means? Who said that? <laughs> There's a prize for it. That's one thing I really like about OSCIA. I've never seen anybody that could take OSCIA and make it into a word. You hear them try, they start off us, 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 and they quit. <laughs> it's one of the few acronyms that I know of that I, I just haven't heard people do that to. There are all sorts of other ones that they, that they can. This is a panel discussion that was a vital part of the program all the time, still is. Farm equipment, of course, was the main part of it because that's why we went out to the Coliseum because that's where the Ontario Farm Equipment Dealers Association was. For a couple of years, they actually tried home appliances, but there weren't enough ladies there to make it run. We're right back to soil erosion again. Save your soil exhibit. And this is a 1949 picture of what they call the first conservation, soil conservation day in Canada. It took place at Heber Downs Farm in Ontario County. And 1,200 people came to watch 65 tractors and six bulldozers and two earth movers and I don't know what not all, remake that farm in one day. They paved the barnyard, they painted the barn, they put a new kitchen in the house. And when they got all done, they decided that they would never do it again because it cost far too much money and took far too much effort. But anyway, that was the farm before they started. And after they got done, they went through it with what they had for a deep ripper back then. Want to try that on 100 acres? <laughs> there they are, they worked the ground all up, got it all ready. These guys are finishing up the berms to, or 
levees or whatever you want to call them to keep the water from washing the soil away. And then we got into the whole business of silage conferences and uh, growing high moisture corn and all that sort of thing. Anybody name these two guys? Chuck Kingsbury. Chuck Kingsbury is the one on the right. And the other one? Where the heck did he go? Stand up, John. Must be John Bannon. It's John Bannum and I think it's John Bannum's farm. And this one I threw in there just because I think we I think we don't treat young people very well these days. This is a letter I got from the Registrar of the Ontario Agricultural College the year before I was about to graduate and he was writing a very apologetic letter telling us that he had had to double the tuition to $200 for the whole year. So when you look down at the bottom you can find out that if you were a really careful student and didn't drink anything and didn't eat any more than they served you in the dining hall, you could get through that whole year for less than $400. The neat part about that was at that time I was working for the uh, soils department preparing county soil maps and I could make enough money in the summer working for them to pay for my year at college. And kids just can't do that anymore. They should be able to. Damn, we've still got soil erosion and now we're into stream bank degradation and ooh, awful mess. We had a program to fix it. Anybody know what it was called? Okay, we'll keep going. <laughs> Still got soil erosion. But we do have alternate watering devices and we do have uh, stream crossings. We've got a couple of guys out here looking at something. I don't know whether it's bobble inks or the remains of soil erosion or the legumes in the bottom of a pasture or what. But John seems to be a pretty favorite picture. And the guy he's got with him is the background, the backbone of this organization has been for quite a little while, I think. Does it look enough like Harold that you recognize him? And now we're moving into the 80s and that was that really, really difficult time when everybody was having trouble with their finances and these three people are talking about the uh, general problems and uh, basically the agricultural finance problems that we had at that time. And this is a picture of a couple of characters out trying to demonstrate a no-till drill on a farm where the farmer didn't believe in no-till and you can see he's plowed everything right up to where the drill's working. <laughs> So I don't know whether we ever convinced him or not, but we did get some no-till and some tilled plots into that farm. But that was, that was early no-till. Then we got into uh, some programs that had something to do with uh, residue management and uh, grass waterways and grass strips, berms. You can see a beautiful row of corn behind there and a father discussing with his son how much cover they have on the field. Yeah. Clothes have changed, the hairstyles have changed, but they're, they're still having problems. Harold's pointing at somebody here. Our honorary president on the left. Is that right? Yeah. Tim. Tim Arnold. That was in Rockwood, wasn't it, Jim? The other's Harold McKnight. You're right. Thank you. Are you two guys? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to split it. <laughs> then we got into this whole business of Rachel Carson and Silent Spring and people getting worried about what they were eating and all the rest of it. And we had spray days and farmers are out there trying to find out what those different weeds are. So we're doing a weed identification thing. This guy brought his old farm sprayer in to see if he could get her tuned up and running again for one more year. <laughs> And then, uh, if you had a little bit of money, you could build yourself a really good pesticide storage. And Harold doesn't get to compete in this little contest, but what does OSCAPAP actually stand for? I, I know, but I won't say it because I work for Harold. There's a man that... It's a disease, actually, when you 
you say the word? <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, it was the last time that the government actually named a program, and they did it by committee. <laughs> Anybody come up with it? Who said that? Say it again. Jim. Jim. Okay, we're going to do it. <laughs> this is just setting up and going to throw it at you. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can argue about it. One of them is to get your hands clean. That's the cleaner. This is the towel. Maybe it's the Maple Leafs game. OSCOPAP 2 is a program that helps solve a whole lot of things and of course people still had to worry about calibrating their sprayers and scouting and checking things out and a lot of them just gave up and said okay I'm going to hire somebody to do it and I think maybe in a lot of cases that's been a real godsend as far as we're concerned in agriculture. Anybody recognize where this came from? Alice in Wonderland? This organization spent a long long time debating and trying to figure out what we were doing and how we could get better support at the county level and how we could build a membership and just one thing after another after another. And uh, if I hadn't thrown this stuff all over the floor, <laughs> we'll forget about it. The other thing that happened was that the government closed an awful lot of their offices at uh, either the right or wrong time, depending on when you're looking at it. And really it opened up an opportunity for this organization to take over program delivery. And I think we've done a pretty good job of, of doing that. And that basically gets us into the 90s when we come out with the environmental agenda and then the environmental farm plan. On the other side, uh, Ag Care came up with the uh, Grower Pesticide Safety Program. And I think those initiatives have really given agriculture a really good reputation and also keep made this organization a really worthwhile and functioning organization. We were talking, they were talking today about a whole lot of things about uh, insects and everything else and bugs in the soil and this isn't, this is bugs in the soil but not the, not bacteria and uh, kind of interesting. And then I really like this one because we do deal with consumers quite a bit. And uh, we do have a whole lingo that goes with food today. And uh, I just thought that was a, an interesting one to have a look at. <laughs> and this has only become popular in the last couple of years because it's the first time the farmers could go on a two week holiday in the sun. <laughs> and damn. We've still got soil erosion. <laughs> this looks a little out of place, right? But when this combine hit the road, it had to have the farmer's name on the side of it and it had to have a wide load permit to go down the highway. And it's only got a, what, a nine and a half or a 10 foot or something foot header on it. And just to show you that there's really not much new in the whole world, I was on a farm one day talking to the guy about various things and we got into talking about water quality and keeping it clean and all the rest of it. And he has an electric fence that runs across there just about the top of the picture. And this was his idea back in 1947. He built a bridge where that mound is and where the water's running over it is a mid-level crossing and he's got a whole bunch of rocks across on the right hand side of that picture so that all the turbulence is off his roadbed so it doesn't wash his road out every, he's got a roadway through there every spring. So the world goes around, comes around and it's been a pleasure, thank you very much. Hey Don, wait a minute. Wait a second Don. On behalf of the organization, we want to give you a token of our appreciation and uh, we thank you so much for uh, the insights and the look that you, that you uniquely have to be able to share with us tonight. Thank so you. let's give Don a big hand again. <laughs>